the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people are evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos, and articles, and images. We spent a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live. It's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story. They were helping their neighbor. If a family member was being evacuated, my group would just jump in and help out. It was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Aloha everyone, I am geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dane DuPont, HawaiiTracker.com, bringing you guys another Kilauea Volcano update, today May 25th, 2021. This would be the 155th day of this eruption, or is it? Is a volcano still erupting? That's a question we can just poke at a little bit here. Um, by one easiest definition, if there's lava on the surface, then the volcano is still erupting. Otherwise, if it's putting out ash or gas or something else like that, you might consider it erupting still. But otherwise, we'll see if we really see signs of that here in Kilauea uh, today. Uh, we will be uh, taking live viewer questions as usual. Uh, Dane will be manning the chats and the streams here. Let us know if you have any issues with our streams and any of the, the questions on chat that he can answer, he will. And otherwise, we'll collect some to discuss as we usually do on our live updates here. So we'll start today with a view of the most recent imagery, and this is an image taken just yesterday. I'm kind of jumping a gun a little bit. Let me back up here and go back to how things looked uh, on May 19th, a few days ago. And this is a USGS video. It was just released uh, two days ago. And this is showing an area of about 20 meters or yards long, essentially, that's undergoing a crustal uh, resurfacing, um, crustal foundering resurfacing event here. Let me play this for you guys here. And you can see that's that last little pit at the base of the west vent would be over that way. And you see a little bit of, of lava at this bottom corner over here and otherwise crusted over. But you see lava starting to move through the crust here and here starts the process 
from the southern corner I'm moving across. And it's pretty windy at the time, and you can see the jaw just has got a really big zoom lens. So when this little gust of wind comes through here, it really blurs and distorts everything, which is kind of interesting. There's a lot of heat shooting through as well. But you can see there, um, not only is all the surface being, being consumed, but you start to see chunks falling from the roof here on this back corner. And I can play it again and zoom it in a little more for you guys to see. But showing that overall the lava level is dropping, right? It's almost like a, like a big gas burp. And you imagine there's some gas collecting underneath here for some reason is able to crack that crust finally. The lava pushes its way out. And I'm just going to reload it so for me here. Jump it forward a little bit. And for you guys. Start it down here at this edge so you can get a better view here. All right, so notice this, this the, the lava level isn't quite up, up to the top of this crater. It's already undergone several of these gas loss events, and the crust itself can in a net raise higher but during this one few second event that's documented on video here on may 19th was this is one of the last overturning foundering events that was seen and then over to the right here i'm going to back that up a part in the right here see that shelf falling right in there we can really see how a lava level is dropping, and look at all these gas bubbles over here. A little bit washed out, but a lot of gas bubbles bursting out all through here. That's showing showing you a little bit of the, the reason for this process, right? It's all about the gas being able to release. And obviously, that's harder the more crusting of the lava lake you get, and that's why you're you're seeing foundering events in areas where the lava lake has stopped circulating um, over time, even beginning back at that eastern half of the lava lake. So looking at the chronology here, um, going back to, this is released on May 20th, but back to May 19th, um, we have, besides that video we just showed you guys, uh, we have a series here of thermals taken, thermal images taken from that south rim as well. So the west, western fissures over here, that inlet area right down in here, and you can see there's still visible flow coming out of it all the way to the end of April, even as you have the first cooling of that southwest end and also the northeast end off, off the screen here. But two weeks later, in the beginning of May, no longer do we have any kind of current that's visible. We have a pond and the crusted pathway flow through it that continues still going. But really, even all of that seems to end uh, shortly after that, that time, May 10th to about May 11th, maybe May 13th, somewhere in that range. Such that in the more recent week here, we've had more isolated pockets, smaller ponds, like you see here. And they have been overturning and foundering and going through that process. But remember, we, we, we know as a reference that a Kilauea Iki Lava Lake in 1959 uh, underwent that foundering event for 10 days after the eruption was over, after lava stopped coming out. So we can't quite see if the lava is coming into the system or not, but you, even if it was not, you would expect there to be some foundering activity continuing for some amount of time, and unknown exactly how long. You know, Kilauea is not exactly like like this this uh, uh, Halemaumau lava lake, and um, a lot of unknowns about the dynamics and how shallow and how how that connects to the lava underneath the crust and all of that stuff. So uh, could be some variations, of course, for that reason as well. That's the thermal thermal release and a couple of visible images to go with that as well. So that last video was zoomed into this little pond here that's at the base of this this now very well crumbled western vent, right? I see quite a lot of rubble. We've been seeing that for some time, but now that we see see this next iteration here and close to the end of May, it's, it's uh, fascinating to note how much rubble is, is formed from this crumbling, especially the south, southern side of this western vent here. So at the base of that, that entry point was somewhere over here. That's where that pond is, right? And for reference, if I zoom it in a little more, you can see this upturned. There's this one block in here that's got the upturned lava bedding. It's all going vertical, right? That tipped over. That's that, that island that was shaped like a heart once upon a time that was near that west vent. That's, our, that's a good reference point right there. So you see that the remaining pond about a week ago, less than a week ago, is about the size of that block. So, um, 
much, much smaller in extent than we've seen throughout the whole eruption, really, right? This is pretty much the tail end of it here, as far as we can tell. So well, let me go back. So that's the, that's the uh, one moment in time, and then during a, re during a resurfacing event, that same spot all the way overturned after the video concludes there. So that's the kind of thing that, that's happening. And you saw the video was only a few seconds long, really. So it's hard to to get all that in some of these time lapses, right? So we'll have we'll look at some time lapses here coming up shortly. First, we'll see this one released by the USGS. But keep in mind that a lot of these frames are you know every ten minutes or every fifteen minutes or every hour or sometimes every day, depending on how fast we're showing you guys. So something to last a few minutes. If you happen to catch the one frame during that turning event, you might you might actually catch it. Otherwise, you only get a sample of a little bit of what's going on, and that's one of the the, the things you have to keep in mind when you're dealing with manipulating time and time lapses and what what's the resolution of what you can see and what might you miss um, what length events right and so that was less important when a whole lava lake was all the way fluid and circulating but now if you have every five minute snapshots you might actually miss a whole a whole something happening so uh, we can look at the thermal time lapses for some clues but really at this point we have to go with reports from the ground right or um, other evidence that's that's out there so USGS did release on May 17th, this time-lapse animation um, showing the last month of changes, the whole crossing over of the smaller western area of the pond um, since about April 20th there. And scale bar is over here on the right. You see the whole, the whole extent of the whole crater all around here and the contraction from the edges and the ponding, and we've covered all this in our updates uh, that we've been doing weekly here for the last few months. So we'll leave it at that. We'll, we'll remix the uh, time lapse a little bit here coming up, but um, let's continue looking at some of these image or images that we have from the USGS HBO. So the May 21st release, uh, May 20th, is showing what that looks like now most of the time. Right? So that May 19th video we saw was happening right in here. And by this point in time, you see it's it's crusted over at, at the time of this photograph, and everything else looks all crusted over as well. Now it's all quite hot, and the lava is still molten underneath there, um, likely at not that great a depth. Right? Uh, we'll talk about that uh, Kiliki analog later on, but likely not at, not at that much depth, and it's likely going to remain liquid in some part, perhaps for over a century. Right? If that would be if it wasn't interrupted by some other process beforehand, which is the mo more likely event here in Kilauea. So here's a view of that May 20th lava surface. And then zoomed in a little more on that west vent area there. And you really can see the extent of that rubble pile of debris here. Not that original volcanic deposit, but actually the crumbling of the cone in the, in the later stages of the waning of the eruption here. And there's the cone, and I believe there's one more for May 20th, and this is a close-up view of that northeastern rim of the lava lake area that's been degassing persistently for the last few months, and showing a few boulders that fell from the crater visible in a perimeter, and they're also getting crusted over in some of the sulfur. So I'll click through on this one and see if we can zoom in a little bit. This is an area that, that has shown a little bit of incandescence, perhaps, as well. It's hard to tell, once again, with the resolution of the time lapses from the thermal cameras, but maybe there's still gas uh, uh, venting from here, and this is an area we've seen a little bit of a glow um, on that B1 camera at night, occasionally. So it's interesting to keep an eye on this one area here, and cool to see this visual photograph. I'll zoom in on here and let's see what we got. There's those boulders that are rolled down off this old um, remains of the, the 2018 collapse crater wall onto this new lava surface. And this new lava surface you can see is already having all kinds of uh, mineral deposits forming along the cracks, right? As a result of the gas moving through the crust and then when it comes through that crust and into the atmosphere and depressurizes it, precipitates and drops a lot of that mineral content. So that's why you see a lot of that, not only on the cracks and the new surface. It's been doing this on this, on this back wall for quite some time, so you see really there's a huge sulfur bank over there now. Right? We'll have to consider naming that some version of a sulfur bank as well. 
back here, please. Right. Um, you have that bigger support bank that's further to the south and here and not part of the same same crater wall. Right? So this is interesting to see that this is a new new forming feature that was not there after the 2018 collapse. It has been degassing persistently. Remember when this this uh, fumarole was way high up on the crater wall, way, way, way above the lake of water. And now it's not as far up from the lake of lake of lava surface and still degassing pretty persistently. So interesting to see all that. You know, this, this can happen even at background levels, and that's where we've come to now, is despite all that huge amount of gas coming out early on, we are back to the last measurement was around 100 tons of SO2 per day, which is essentially like background levels. Uh, the comparisons to the to the lake of water era before this eruption, you know, you have to keep in mind that the water might have been absorbing some of that sulfur dioxide, and so that it might be hard to compare that directly. So we're in a range of, of what we've seen without a, without lava coming out of the ground, and you know, plus or minus that uncertainty to that. All right, so we'll move to the May twenty fifth release here, and another image, and you can see here. The two glowing spots are there and there. And here's that west vent still degassing over here on the left. And you can actually see some glow coming from the top of that cone right in there as well in this wider angle photograph. So there's that one there and these two spots in here. And you can have glow continue for quite some time, in fact, right? You know, um, depending on the, on the area, you know, it, it could be a over a week, a few weeks, you know, um, it could end sooner depending on exactly how it's how it's caressing over underneath there. It's hard to tell, but it wouldn't be surprising to see persistent hot spots glowing um, for a while. What we're more interested in knowing is whether they're putting out lava or not, because that's what we might base one definition of whether it's erupting or not. And so before we, we address this, whether it's erupting or not, and I will ask Dane for your input here, because as we know, the USGS in the past has been uh, uh, had other criteria to judge whether eruptions actually end or not, right? As in, for example, 2018. And so we can consider that dynamic as we consider what's happening here in 2021. But first, let me go through these time lapse and web cameras and show you guys here. This is a similar view as USGS uh, release, but I have it zoomed in for you guys a little more and sped up a little more as well. So you can see a little bit quicker this process from the corners in forming that flow, isolating the upper and lower ponds, and eventually crossing all the way over. Let it run one more time without the scribbles here. You guys can see that. Yeah, these are all uh, F1 thermal camera from the USGS HBO. All their courtesy imagery that we've assembled. Mahalo Bob Martin. Shout out Bob Martin for continuing that um, image capture as well. Looking just at the past week here, you can see still some foundering happening at the beginning of, of a week ago. And that seems to peter out around the 20th, 21st. It pops back up again on, on the 22nd. And then you see just a couple of spots over here pop up on the 23rd. And that's really the last convincing heat that's visible on this increment of time scale that we're looking at over here. So um, obviously if a lot of pops up in between, you should see it hot in the next frame. And so what we're seeing here is, is likely a pretty good indication um, that there hasn't been any lava come up since the 23rd, in fact, out of either of those holes. So, see it all in context from the very beginning to the very end here. Thought I'd assemble this for you guys. Now that we have a hole zipping up at the end here, all the way to solid. More time because it does go by quick here. Our hole, in the end, five months plus a couple of days so far. If I'm going to define it on a basis of lava on a surface, then I would call it on a 23rd as the last day. So slightly over uh, five months there thus far. And of course, the chance is still there that it reactivates or pops back up. And you know, that's also was not uncommon to see in previous eruptions as in 2018. So the more recent 24 hour automatic time lapse from USGS is shown here. So for the last 24 hours, just that same Glowing area. This is that lower crusted pond, the upper crusted pond we saw overturning was up here. So depending on the angle, you might, you know, from this angle from the the the, the west, we do see this pond a little better, and possibly from the B1 camera, which looks from the opposite point of view, 
the S1 camera, you might see more glow from this spot as well. Note that here, but overall, very, very quiet. One thing I didn't point out, although it was on there, is if we, if we look now at our, our temperature range, it's, it's uh, been reset here. So now we're seeing our upper value is in the range of 250, 300, um, as opposed to 500, 600. And I don't know if we believe the exact numbers as being um, what the temperature is on a surface down there, but it's more what it's measuring at that distance from the instrument. Some attenuation, of course. But still, just still, it's a, some indication of the relative scale of heat that we're no longer in at five, six hundred range. We're down at two, three hundred range, and fairly steady. So, if you're interested to see if lava has burst out at any point, and the colors are all rescaling all the time, then a key in, in this phase of the eruption is to look at that maximum temperature. And if you see a five, six hundred, you say, okay, well, it just popped open a little, a little pad of lava somewhere where we see the, the hottest temperatures at that point in time. So as we watch over the next perhaps month to see what happens here, uh, that's something to keep in mind. A closer eye on now is this temperature scale here on the right. So we'll cycle through a few of these other web cameras. And of course, because there's no more surface lava, the nighttime view, you really don't see a whole lot. The daytime view isn't changing a whole lot. It's just the weather. So some of these other web cameras, like this KW camera, the visible view of what we just saw on a, th saw on a thermal F1, uh, a little less interesting, although I did want to note, you know, that there right here is that during that nighttime, you see a little bit of glow from that back wall right along in there. See it very, very dimly here. Um, that's that fuming area that we saw, like, saw the crack on a, um, on a B1 camera. Got here shortly as well. First, the S1 camera. And we don't have the automatic animation for this one functioning. But you can see here, there's that underhang that you can see a little bit better from the south side underneath that base of the west vent. So possibly you might see some glowing coming from in here, from this angle. And whereas from this angle, that other point of glow, which is down in here, is harder to see. But those are the two spots that we have. They're kind of candidates for the, the longest lasting heat so far. Okay, and there's a B1 camera. And let's reload this to make sure we have the most current view here. A little more fumy. But it's this area down in here that we've seen that glowing puka, that glowing hole. And that area that we saw a little bit of glow in that, visible in a KW camera from the other angle. So this is an area to keep an eye on as well still, right? And the question is is going to uh, be relevant here, you know, is what happens next? Uh, can lava, is lava just done erupting because of some internal property of its own? Or is it something that the dynamics of it changed? For example, uh, the elevation of this west vent is actually actually now in a range of this liquid lava underneath this crust here. And is there possible any possible interaction there? That's something to think about coming up in the future here. But uh, just to note, to finish it off here before our first uh, our first break here, and we're, we're talking about this eruption as of today, May twenty fifth. This is today's USGS HBO update still states Kilauea volcano is erupting, right? And of course, we have to remember that tied to that is this alert level watch color code, right? So if they decide, if they declare that it's not erupting, then all is, there's a lot of other consequences as far as alert watches and, you know, uh, other response duties, right? As far as how often they issue updates and everything else. So for our purposes, I'm happy to keep continuing getting daily updates here and have it to, have it to stay at the status Although I might define it slightly different, differently for a different purpose apart from USGS is primarily concerned with emergency management, right? So for an emergency manager, yes, keep your eye on it still. Uh, there's no reason to, to decrease your vigilance at this point in time. But geologically, you could define it as being over for two days now, um, presuming it does not reactivate. And worth noting that we've discussed in the past the Mauna Ulu eruption of 1969 to 74 had a several month interruption and was considered by, by many to be a, a one eruptive episode right others disagree and call it two of course because it's such a lengthy interval and that's that's where we come down to the definition of when is it actually over and not over also having something to do with it right so um um just to note, the depth hasn't changed. 751 feet deep, 229 meters. We'll note that that later. And here's a 100 tons per day of SO2, as it was also noted here. 
and um, they're also, as I noted, relating this to the period of less than 50 tons per day of the recent uninterrupted period from 2018 to 2020. And I, I object a little bit to that because of the buffering of the SO2 in that lake of water that we know was acidic, right? You know, when you had sulfur deposits in it. Um, so you would imagine that 100, you know, is, is poss possibly an equivalent there, right? Especially when you look back to other eras, as Dane pointed out, uh, that might have up to 200 tons a day coming out in background level with not, without lava. And so um, otherwise, the only thing we'll refer to when we turn to our data here after our um, after we hear from Dane and, and say, say some um, thank yous and get some questions here, is the East Riftstone observations here. Um, they are still saying refilling at similar rates. They haven't changed this at all. Um, and we'll look a little bit in more detail at what's happening in some of these signals to try to pick a little bit at what might be happening next. And of course, we don't have the answers. We're just uh, uh, trying to uh, show the data and help you um, think about what's going on. Right, so. Um, they note here that total depth is unchanged since May 11th. Yeah, that's true that we haven't changed from this 229 number. Um, there was one surge of, of uh, uh, were popped up, not quite a meter, on the 13th, really. So the 13th is the last lava injection on a measurement. And I just thought I would note that for posterity before I forget it myself here, because we might see this number, this, this as the, perhaps a date that's given more importance, when really that's... May 11th doesn't mean a whole lot. It's more the 13th or the 23rd, perhaps. Or, you know, maybe the 20th when the circulation stops up in the middle. So that's all the USGS update we're going to go in here. And really, the, you know, what I would like to hear from Dane here is, you know, this Kilo volcano is erupting. What do you think, Dane? How, how, would, you, how would you take, what's your take on this? I don't know. To me, it's, it's weird um, because, like, in 2018, we had the <clears throat> standard that, USGS was deferring to, which was basically 90 days without lava at the surface means the eruption's over. Mm -hmm. And it almost feels like you need like two different standards, one for a flank eruption and one for the lava lake itself. Because it's, uh, I could easily see this eruption, say we have two months without lava, right? I'd be comfortable at that point saying, oh, that eruption's dead and over and done with. And then lava comes back up it's like, all right, new eruption. But based upon the official standards, it would be the same eruption. So I don't know, like, to me, that's, that's weird. 90 days at the summit of Kilauea seems like you could have multiple eruptions that come, go, come, go. I don't know. It's just uh, that criteria is kind of interesting to me. Um, I would say that this one looks like it's essentially done erupting. And this also goes back to 2018. Do you count the last little bit of gas movement as the actual end of the eruption? Or is that the dying breath of the eruption itself? Like it's, it, I can see the issue being the, the, the volcano or the volcano alert levels and mm -hmm. having to make changes off of those, um, which for, government organizations and bureaucracy change does not come easy so they want to make sure on that so maybe i could see wait a month one month without lava and then you call the summit eruption done or three months seems like too long to me um, what's your thoughts yeah it's a good, good point to bring up that 90 day criteria that's been used before right i'm just putting in here this front page of the usgs site still says in big bold letters kilo away what kilo is erupting right so um, yeah, I, 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 it is interesting. You know, it's really uh, ultimately doesn't really matter, I suppose. You know, there's no people being really affected by this. Um, really, it's a matter of what the what the USGS is doing themselves, right? Um, I think now it's a little bit more bureau bureaucratic, and as, as far as how often the updates come, given the status level, for example, right? And so, I could see them continuing, you know, um, daily updates for. A while they're obviously not tired of doing it yet or they would have changed it already and maybe that might be coming in not too long because because of that you never know um, right well without the eruptions been the copy paste uh, buttons on the computer have been probably getting plenty of use up at usgs just because the the update from day to day it's like basically the same as yesterday just a little less <laughs> you yeah, could run yeah. that update for the past two months and you'd basically be right i mean um yeah I know yes. they do more than that, but, you know, in essence, it's 
doesn't need daily updates on this one. Right. It, even if you're, even if lava does re, you know, it has another resurfacing event. Let's say in that area we were just looking at that was prone to it before. Well, I'd be okay with that still being at yellow alert level for the volcano. Like just because there's visible lava at the surface doesn't mean that it, you know, has to be at orange to me. The, right. the orange rating three months ago made total sense. Right now, I'm not sure it's justified. And it's right. probably the same conversation happening up at USGS in terms of, all right, when do we pull the trigger? And we know from the the way that the erupt the the notifications or the alert level changed prior to this eruption, that that process takes a while for them, right? Because they were the uh, we were talking about it, the eruption level needing to be raised for two to three weeks before this eruption took place, right? We were having that conversation each time. And then the eruption happens and USGS uh, says, oh, yeah, we're in the process of, the process of up in the alert level. And then the, the eruption just happened the day before that notification was posted publicly. Right. So they could be well in the works right now. They could be even a week into trying to change the alert level down to yellow. I don't know if they are, but they could be. And it's just caught up in the bureaucratic wheels right now. Yeah, good so point. that's you know my take on it. Yeah, well, we'll just, we'll wait and see, and you know I think it really doesn't matter that much. I think really for the most part, the biggest Im impact of this eruption was the gas for the most part for a long time, especially that first week, and really the last month it's dropped off significantly. So the impact really is is minimal, right? And unfortunately, it means maybe, maybe a little bit less glow for park visitors that are coming now in throngs to the national park. Um. But still interesting to think about, you know, maybe, maybe maybe you'll be the one that sees that resurfacing pop open and, and see the glow for the five minutes that it's there that's not caught in the webcams. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, let's uh, get into some questions. And But before we do, I do want to thank our sponsors and everybody that helps make this possible. If you enjoy this type of content, make sure to like, subscribe, ring the notification bell. All those things help this channel grow, help us continue to bring this type of content especially the sharing, you know, don't be afraid to drop it on your Facebook or Twitter or whatever. That really does help out. If you feel so inclined to make monetary donations, we take those on whitetracker.com slash support. Uh, we also take super chats on YouTube. The, I do want to thank a few people that have made those uh, donations on whitetracker.com. Ellen L, Mel S, Tony B, Denise J, Elizabeth W, Jessica Ann and Robert G. Appreciate it. Really helps. You know, goes a long way to keeping this content coming. Mahalo, yes. And we do have Mahalo. two official sponsors. Want to uh, shout out as well. First is Kaleo's Bar and Grill in the heart of Bahoa. It's a fine dining uh, establishment with a little bit of a twist on some more traditional dishes. Adds a little bit of local flair up to the um, to some. So some meals that you're probably accustomed to. The ribeye there is incredible. Uh, fish and chips is always, you know, perfect. It's indoor, outdoor dining, COVID safe policies, all that. Also, you know, nice little bar in there. Really great place for visitors and locals alike to stop in and get a bite to eat. Uh, one of the better places in Boa, you know, to me at least. The second is Kalani Tours. And they do a variety of different tour packages, but they're really focused on the personalized tour experience. Instead of those big buses where they, you know, cram everybody in like sardines and just shuffle them around the island. These, these guys really do focus on education and that interpersonal connection, try and get somebody that is enjoyable to be around to help guide and educate the visitors that take them up uh, that they do volcano tours might not be much glow up there to see right now but they do do them they do waterfall tours and they also do some uh kona coffee tours as well which you know start uh, which end with a, a cold refreshing uh beverage at the end uh just you know really good uh, time out there so we appreciate our sponsors help make this possible with that. Let's get into some questions. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Oh, we, um, 
final shout out is for um, the Hawaii Island Strong Fund, which we received a grant through to help make the, uh, through the Hawaii Community Foundation to, to help continue bring this content to you. There is a ton of information, a ton of prep work that goes into these episodes and our written updates as well. So we appreciate everybody that helps make this uh, content continue to be possible. All right, let's dive into some questions, huh? Yeah. All right, so first one is from Richard Williams who asks uh, about the satellite imagery that we show every once in a while that measures deformation. Um, can those be used to measure movements on Kilauea's lava lake crust or is that too much to ask from uh, INSAR? I, I think, uh especially in the early phases, you probably could catch it uh, more easily because it was changing pretty fast, pretty significantly. And so, I mean, from before the eruption to the first weekend, it was, what, 100 meters or something. It was some huge amount of lava already. The trick with the satellites is that that crater, especially early on um, and still now, it's, it's pretty deeply inset in the topography. So it's hard to look at it at an angle. And remember, the satellites aren't flying directly over the top of the crater. They're flying off to the side a little bit. And so they're looking at an angle over, trying to look down in that pit. And they're flying by really fast. Yeah, so because of the pit, that limits how many views you get. And that makes it more complicated. I think that part of it more so um, than, than, it, than anything else, right? Um, but also in the recent times, you know, with a laser rangefinder, we're seeing we're seeing values measuring to the to the centimeter, reportedly. Although it's all averaged out, right? Um, centimeter at least to the meter, and I, you may not be able to get that resolution um, with uh, the INSAR. So um, I think it, it was there. There was some recent, uh, I want to say, early on releases of satellite data because it was changing so drastically. But we really haven't seen it that much since then. And that's that's probably why. Although comparing what we see now to comparing it to four months ago would, would still be pretty interesting. Clarissa asks, uh, we can see the shelf dropping as to where and what direction is it uh, moving? Which shelf are we talking about? I believe the one that was forming from the as the lava lake uh, subsided or degassed. Right, right, right. So we're talking about that that, that USGS video we're seeing, yeah. So um, I believe so. Yeah, so as a lava level, the lava level is as high, it's basically touching the bottom of that, that overhang and it's forming a crust against it. And then when when the overturning process is happening and the gas is escaping and the crust is being consumed and the lava level starts dropping, then that little bit of crust that's attached to the top of that underhang is no longer support, supported from below. So it's it's got some gooey lava in there, so it's stuck a little bit. So it hangs for a minute and then it falls eventually with a little delay is what I believe is happening over there. So uh, as far as what it's flowing, it's, it's basically just it's flowing. It's kind of doing these kind of convection cycles down. So you see a little bit moving this way and that way. And it's not clear if it's flowing underneath the crust still, right? Uh, we saw for a long time that, that there was flow towards that once big island. That's no longer an island, of course. Uh, and we just didn't see what happened underneath there. So we still don't know what happens uh, underneath that crust that's forming. And it's hard to tell if there's movement away from there in any, any way that's expressed on the surface of that pond. Kenny uh, from Facebook or from YouTube asks, with the continuing DI cycles, does that, I'm going to rephrase this a little bit. Uh, with the continuing DI cycles, does that make any, any, does that have any weight on the determination if the eruption is over or not? Do DIs play into that at all? Yeah, usually not. It's considered more of a background signal. We are still trying to figure them out, right? But there's not anything convincing that we can see. This kind of DI activity indicates consequence X. That's just not something we've that we've come to yet. So uh, it's interesting to note them that they're happening, um, but they might just be in the background and may not have any, any relation. They, they have in the past been linked essentially to the existence and presence and activity within the shallow chamber of Halemau'u. So it's interesting to note that the source uh, magma chamber is still undergoing some process that's, that's causing those DIs. And uh, we saw that 
the ring eruption that was affecting the output uh, of, of the eruption. So that seems like, the, like it was connected. And now that process is happening in a magma chamber with, without lava coming to the surface, as far as we can tell. Um, we'll look at the data here shortly, and we'll look at the, the, the DI cycles and, and all that in more detail, and how it ties to the depth and all, all the other things as well. But uh, there's, there's no evidence of magma coming in right now to that lake under the crust that we can tell. And so it's more of the pattern behind the DIs that's important, right? You know, if we can filter out the DIs, what's the trend of the tilt after that? And that's what we'll look at shortly here. Right. Nathan, our friend Nathan from Facebook asks, what's the difference between eruption levels and visitors' access to places within the park? In other words, if they drop the alert level down, would visitors be able to access more areas within the park? Uh, probably not. Um, the, 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 there's, so. there's the, there is a little bit of a thought that that's, uh, behind that question. That's that we tie a little bit this, this era of eruption, um, to the act, to, to the closures that exist, but the closures really stem back to 2018 to the collapse of the summit and all the repair work that's been done and all the park infrastructure, you know, um, all the plumbing, all the, the buildings, uh, the trail work is all ongoing now still. And as they've right. repaired certain trails, then they've reopened them. And it's more the pace of that and the funding for that and the, the manning of those projects, which is, you can imagine after that kind of collapse, your, your recovery plan isn't just one year long, right? You're talking about probably a decade or more. So we're in the middle right. of that process now and I think the opening has more to do with that timeline than it does with any eruption status of the volcano um, or right. the pandemic either, in fact, right? Just, to, you know, yeah. because that is still, you know, also something that affected that. Was, that did cause some closures for the most part. Um, the park is operating with, with COVID protocol in place, right? So the, the museum itself isn't open inside, only the gift shop limited numbers at a yeah. time. Um, everything I'm else gonna, is outdoors. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and add to that one. Um, it doesn't matter as much what the volcanic activity is day to day or week to week as much as it matters who the superintendent of the national park is. The last superintendent was very conservative in terms of letting people see the lava, whereas superintendents prior to that were very liberal in letting people see the lava. So very, I've heard, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's been varied, basically. Um, I've heard good things about the new superintendent potentially lightening up on some of that stuff. We'll see how it goes. But yeah, that's to me, that's the biggest thing is who's in charge and what's the, the, the direction they want to take the park in. Yeah, yeah, and I would add to that the process of doing so. And on top of that, the background of already trying to be recovering from 2018. Right. I mean, I would love, you know, for anyone on the park who's listening and not to hear what I say, but I would love to see that that whole critter rim pathway, which where you could walk around the whole rim, and you know at some point be able to look down into that new lava lava lake surface from the west side. And you know I know there's a lot of cracks in the old road, but you know um, the geologists can do it. And you know as some of our geologists have said before, you know if the, if it's safe for them to go, then it's safe for anybody to go, right? Um, although. They are using protective equipment and have monitoring gear and all that. You know, you you would imagine that um, the impact is really fairly limited at this point in time. So there's a process, I know, and I'm not expecting it to happen in a hurry, but I would love at some point before the next eruption comes up and they consider whether to close something again, that actually is something open that would be considered to be closed, right? That we can make a pace as far as you know, seeing more of even what happened in 2018, we haven't seen all of that yet because the areas of the park haven't haven't um, all been reopened, right? Naturally, of course. Um, we'll end with we'll end this Q and A with one last question from Richard on YouTube. He asks, "Is there uh, any ground level groundwater level fluctuations uh, around the crater?" And uh, I think I saw one other question from him about the lava of uh, the water lake returning uh, potentially after the eruption so if we think about what happened after the 2018 collapse that 
ended in August 2018, it took until July of 2019 for us to see water actually appear within that within that pit. And a couple of things there, you know, one, it appeared at the level that that corresponded to the elevation of water, groundwater in a nearby well, right? And so, to, as far as the first question fluctuations we don't have a live data stream from that well and so it really takes someone to go back and measure that again for us to tell if there had been fluctuations so we don't know what local fluctuations there have been around there but you would imagine there certainly are some um but since since it's a different situation than post 2018 the crater is no, no longer as deep so now the area that water would come into is the the area where the lava is and, and so it can't take that space because there's already lava there. And the lava is going to stay hot for a long, 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 long time. And so what you're likely to see instead, and you see this already, is you see steaming around the perimeters of the lake, not just in that inner crater, but if you go and visit the National Park on, a, on those upper parts, the upper downdrop block, you can see lots of steaming cracks. And even the wall of the downdrop block, you can see lots of steaming cracks. And as the water tries to go through there, we're going to have a, a new ring of steam vents essentially all around there that... That is the interaction of that groundwater with that hot magma that's going to be there for a long time still. All right. Well, that does it for this question and, question, oh my, question and answer segment. We'll be doing one more at the end. So if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. And we'll get them in after the data analysis. Back to you, Phil. Right on, Mahala Dane. So we'll turn now to looking at some of the data here. And we'll start off looking at this graph of the depth of a lava lake over the last month. Now, remember, this is this is done by a, a novel rate, a laser rangefinder at the summit, and it's pointing at one specific pot, spot on that ponded surface. And that particular spot, as I've said in some, some of our previous updates here, changes its pattern, crests over essentially right around here, sometime around the, the 6th or the 7th, where we, we have less of this oscillation and we have, it seems like, a cresting over with foundering, overturning, foundering, overturning, and then the whole thing lifts up and lifts up again. Right, so here's the 11th and here's that 13th day that I'm talking about, the last injection of lava that was, that was apparent in this one measurement spot. And ever since then, it looks like it's still undergoing perhaps this degassing and maybe there was some foundering or I'm not sure exactly the process. A little bit of a data gap here. But overall, you see a pretty background de a level decreasing here um, that's pretty flat. So if we zoom into it, we're looking for the past week. You can see the details here. Our scale on the left in meters is now going down to 0.05 meters, right? Five centimeters between each of these little um, hash marks. So these are those very small scale variations. And you're starting to see a little pixelation here with just the resolution of the instrument as well and how it's processing. So still those oscillations happening, but overall a very little change. 0.25 up here and down here, let's call it this level right in there. That's 0.19, let's say. So it's, very, you know, it's, it's dropping very, very slowly. In fact, more slowly than we saw during other previous times of, op of larger open lava surfaces when the level might drop as much as a meter or two um, throughout the course of degassing. It's not dro dropping nearly that fast, nearly as much, and um, that is interesting. And that's the, the the depth of the lava there. And correspondingly, the SO2 gas emissions from the volcano have also dropped. Here's 100 tons per day is as low as hash mark. 50 is the bottom. It's 50 tons per day hash marks up here. So about a month ago, we were still getting some measurements that were in a range of 500 to 200 through here and really it's been and one above 200 otherwise really below 200 tons per day for most of the last two weeks here so that and you know perhaps a trend going downwards although you know with all the deflation and inflation events you might imagine there's more scatter that you're you're having to get a little lucky on to have this trend be, be exactly right still apparently a downward trend of the gas here and that matters because we still believe that the so2 emissions are the main indication main proxy for how much lava is coming out at the effusion rate so these levels now are essentially within a background value i've talked about you know how the us just mentioned there it's not quite to that below 50 and i would say that's not reasonable to expect it to get below 50 because we don't have a big pond of water there anymore so 100 is, is already pretty low we've seen other eras where it was you know, it might drop it on a 50, you know, for all we know. 
but we're already in that range of there's really not a whole lot of lava coming out um, for this one. So there is the SO2, and um, because it is so difficult to get the satellite images, the USGS is releasing a lot of these DEMs, right? So May 13th DEM uh, is using helicopter overflights, and they're using um, um, uh, what is it called again? They, where they they uh, um, uh, they they, mod, they 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 take a series of photographs and then they, they uh, use a motion and reconstruct a three D image from the uh, as an image from motion or I forget the exact terminology now right to generate these things. so this one May thirteenth this was already for that one spot had had was done uh, overturning so you'd imagine this is mostly the the, the status uh, right now uh, as as we first stage of eruption if it is that perhaps the only stage uh, is waning here we'll refer to this in the future perhaps once again just an example of you know if you have to keep updating your data sets where the new data, new data set within here the old crater collapse crater and then um, everything outside of here is that down drop block that's steaming all these cracks through here and this thing right here and even farther out steaming over there that's our, our, our view. I did want to bring this back up. This was uh, something we covered months and months and months ago. So this was posted in the end of January, January 28th, um, and some Facebook discussion here. And the question was, back then, any estimation on when the Western vent will be submerged if the current effusion rates continue? And they note, the West vent initially opened at an elevation of 730 meters above sea level, more or less. right? And so we'll just stop it there. Um, but they do note that there is a 40 meter high spatter cone protecting the vent and some other stuff there. So 730 meters above sea level, right? I want to make sure that we come here to this most recent USGS map back on May 7th. And we can note that the surface here was at 746 meters above sea level. And so we knew, do know that that Western vent is protecting it, but that source of that crack originally when it opened up was 730 meters, 15 meters, almost 50 feet below that level of lava lake now. So when we're seeing the lava come in and that entry point and the west vent and all that, it's, is it possible something reorganized underground? Maybe. Um, we are in that in that range of possible interaction. You know, could, the, could that cone protect it somewhat, but maybe not all the way? Maybe. Um, was it something internal to the lava? Was, did the lava run out of oomph, out of gas energy, and that's what really crusted over? And this is just a coincidence? That could be the case as well. And as far as we can tell from the public, uh, without uh, all the full data set of the USGS, um, it's unclear exactly what what the, the relationship is there. Right? Um, maybe it's the drowning of the vent that release that, that essentially triggers the re the reduction of flow and a reduction of SO two, and maybe this is a critical magical point of equilibrium. And we'll see if that's the case. That might mean something different for what comes next. Um, then if it's just out of its own oomph and, you know, um, maybe that, that might make it more likely to reactivate if it's just this vent surface interaction. So that's something, um, a curiosity to keep an eye on here as we see what happens next with Kilauea. So that's just, uh, for those wondering, those are the numbers, 730 to 746 meters there. So do we see any sign on the deformation of any, anything funky happening because of that rearrangement, right? You gotta imagine that magma is still coming into the volcano long term. So where is it going? What's going on with that? So here's our tilt plot, ground tilt. The last two days is showing coming out of a deflation inflation event and going back into one. And so we'll zoom out to the last week here and there it is. There's a one, the last one and up and down. And we do have a note for later, a small little offset over here from the earthquake we had in the south flank over the weekend. We'll talk about that here shortly. 4.2 but we really got to zoom out to the last month to see this pattern here and so here is our we're currently in a deflation event and our deflation inflation events are getting bigger again like they were before and so that's interesting that whatever period of adjustment was happening through here with smaller deflation inflation events that seems to be transitioning and once again it's harder harder to put any kind of causality we're just you know uh, uh, noting this for future in case it later becomes obvious what's happening or more apparent right um, but what I mentioned before, in response to, to uh, uh, who, 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 where was the question from? Um, 
Richard, perhaps, um, is the background level here. Oh, from Kenny. Sorry, Kenny. So the question from Kenny. The background level, if we were to ignore the actual drops in deflation inflations here, here, and here, the actual level is a rising level here. Most evidence since about this time, around about the 13th of May, right? After the 11th, here's the 11th. So somewhere in that, in that range of crossing over being mostly complete, we start to see this inflation on the volcano. So how much inflation? Let's look at right here. This is getting close to two. Maybe we'll call it one to be generous, one microradian. And the level up here is close to six, let's call it, right? So about five microradians of inflation. And that over the course of perhaps two weeks or so, a little less than two weeks, 10 days. Um, so in that range, it's not very fast. Um, it is notable because it is getting, you know, five microradians is, is starting to emerge beyond that background threshold of maybe it's it's some more significant cycle rather than some uh, one of the other many cycles that occurs in the volcano that we're trying to look through and filter out to really see what's happening behind there right so um, interesting to note that inflation pattern there um, not if it starts doing this then we'll know okay something is going to happen as far as event change or, or coming up so we'll look for that but there's no sign of anything imminent it looks like it's building pretty slowly back up and um, maybe that indicates that there was some, um, there's still some time for it to build pressure to do anything else. And then we get into the range of how long does it have to be before we call it a new eruption if it does something after a while. Don't have an answer to that today. We'll just leave that as a hanging question here. So we'll move to the GPS though. The, the GPS has been showing that extension of the caldera north to south for a long time now. That continues. And so that's showing us that there's still magma coming in the volcano more than likely still pushing the, the summit, still swelling the summit and pushing the upper edges apart. And so they're spreading apart and are also rising slightly. So magma is still coming in. It's just not able to make it out through that pathway into the lava lake, apparently. And maybe that's something to do with, with that lava level, right? And maybe that's why we've seen this. The first week, we did not see that pattern when we had lava coming out of the north vent before that vent was drowned. And really, it's since that north vent was drowned, we've seen this pattern coming up. And of course, the west vent uh, has been uh, above the zone of interaction that we've thought for a while, but maybe we finally come to that here. See, you know, maybe in the future we'll hear more from the USGS on that as well. So that's the, the, the GPS here at the, at the summit. Um, we come we've down to the East Rift Zone. And we can see there's still some scatter in our data here. We can see that there, there's still adjustment happening and quite a lot of spread in the, in the data set there. But the pattern is still, um, still appears generally to be something like that with, without being able to tell, resolve some of this finer scale, whatever's going on here, some of this error. And so um, I would, as I said last week, I can still ignore this little up and down motion here because it's hard, hard to tell exactly. Uh, how much of that is true data or artifact of the measuring process. Okay. So that's the, that's just the tilt at the summit. I think it's time we check in with tilt a little uh, uh, elsewhere in a volcano as well, just, just because we're curious, you know, where might that might be going? Is it going anywhere obvious? Here's our summit station at Wikihun at the top. You can see that pattern we we're just looking at. And if we look around the summit, we see a similar pattern as well. It's a sand hill in the southwest, similar inflation deflation pattern with an overall um, rising trend here. Kilauea Iki, similar thing on that one blue line um, azimuth. On the east rift, the escape road is a little ambiguous what's going on, but still no giant anything like that that's of concern. You know, we're, remember, we're filtering out all these other smaller cycles and um, looking for more of a volcanic signal that's obvious, and nothing is very obvious in there. Further east at Pu'o'o, this is the POC station. It's still putting out data, and uh, we know there's a lot of deformation on the ground around that area, so we are a little suspicious of the site, but um, it does. the data does appear coherent from minus 1 to 1 1.5 microradians. Not a huge range there, and showing some little bit of changes through there as well. And possibly some settling events. It's not quite clear what's going on here if that relates to, to some you know interaction of the East Rift with the summit. Um, 
that's happening on a, on a back end of this uh, deflation inflation event here. So something we'll look at in more detail as, as, as we continue this tail end of the eruption here is, is there a connection of the East Rift with the summit, right? Because we'd like to know if like in the past, we saw so much magma in East Rift that was pressurized that every deflation inflation event at the summit was mirrored at Pu'o'o as well after a short delay. So with that in mind, we go to Pu'o'o, we really don't see that pattern anywhere else in this back part of this graph. And we're just getting a little curious um, what interaction is actually happening here, but it's not quite clear and it doesn't look like it's anything quickly building um, towards it, escalating towards anything more major. And moving down the rift zone to the Jonica station, uh, we're, we're interested in this blue line here, and you can see very slight variations. This is one microradian, uh, half microradian hash marks here. So some slight variations and really not a whole lot of major change and nothing that shows any connection to the summit there at all. Um, look on a south flank as well. A lot of cyclicity there, but essentially flat. And don't see a whole lot of other stations that, that pool. POO station did lose the one azimuth. The other one is still bringing in some cycles here, but it's not showing any real major zero to maybe two, perhaps. You know, so you know it's hard to tell what's what's real there. But that's the little we have on the public facing side. Um, USGS data. That's a tilt. Let's look at GPS a little bit more since we are curious where the magma is going. We still don't see any sign of it going anywhere obvious. Um, this is a summit station here. So uh, one of the ones that's measuring a distance, the north end is still going north and still rising on an up component over here in the southwest, also rising and was moving south and maybe slightly some slight adjustment, although we're always a little skeptical of this last little last little iteration of data here at the right end of the graph because it does seem to vary and adjust and um, improve over time. Um, but nothing obvious here on this, for example, the east signal as, see this, this was a signal leading up to the, uh, the beginning of the eruption here, so nothing quite as obvious happening um, over here at the outlet station. Uh, Byron's Ledge, similar pattern there. Crater Rim, similar pattern, still moving up as well, moving south. This is the other end of that distance line. And south moving south, north moving north, both moving upwards, caldera spreading. On the East Rift, uh, here is Mana Ulu. Mana Ulu is wiggling to the east a little more here, so something might be happening pushing Mana Ulu east. And this is a pattern we're seeing a little bit here on some of these uh, uh, upper, upper, um, or maybe the, the upper East Rift zone beyond that connector zone, right? You know, past the bend, Mana Ulu went onward. We're still seeing movement a little bit. It's hard to, hard to see what the resolution is there. Overall pattern of, if, of it moving south. And that's in zone of interaction of the rift zone and the south flank as well. So we're curious there, right? Uh, kind of Nui Ohamo, seven miles east of the summit here. Um, you can see is uh, uh, maybe the more interesting signal is this north signal here, the one that's orthogonal to the rift zone. And looking down here, to this is December, this hash mark right in here. You can see where it was. It was pushing north leading up to that, like, like pressure was building in the rift zone before back flowed towards the summit. And then largely decreased before resuming, then recently decreasing, and maybe now it's resuming again. You know, we're, we're curious about how valid is this little last little bit of the plot once again as usual. But if we note that it's not just one station, but several, like here's Kamomoa, showing a very similar pattern, then perhaps it's more believable that there is a trend there, right? That the rift zone magma does appear to be going into that upper east rift zone area once again, um, especially uh, more evident in the last few weeks that was changed from a couple weeks before that. And so that's interesting. Lots of little variations in here, and you know we've only seen one state from the SGS from a route here where refilling the rift zone as normal, and they ignore this little this little wiggle right in here. As far as the text updates go. Uh, by pool itself, very similar pattern. There it is again. So you see magma is filling the upper east rift section. Um, the jacuzzi station also getting pushed to the east as it did before the eruption. So magma is maybe not coming out the summit, but it seems to be filling the upper east rift area. Perhaps is what this is saying through here. Um, we keep going down the rift zone. We get, get to Jonica, and we do not see we do not see patterns. Past Pu'o'o, so we believe that whatever barrier there between Pu'o'o and Jonica existed is still intact. 
and it's more common that you have activity up at that bend of the rift zone rather than than um, farther down a rift anyways so interesting to note and of course that brings uh, to mind to me this whole area of the Kauai fault system right there's a whole fault zone that connects the the edge of the s southern edge of the the uh, rift zone to the collapse area of the summit to the south flank to the southwest rift and that's a structural area that opens up when the south flank moves and magma is known to be going into the, there before and there's no obvious signal there but i'm curious and maybe is something like that happening is it in the area of the east rift so i'd like to also look at the south flank a little bit just to make sure there's nothing funky happening there and this is the one closest to the summit so we're not really see seeing any there's no obvious change here's eruption in december and you can see the patterns are really nothing abnormal for the last five months here All right moving further south Himal, devil's throat which is close to the Koai fault zone you really don't see any indication of magma moving into that area there's nothing obvious here um but that's something that could happen in the future. Um, remember, the volcano likes to fill areas underground as much as it likes, you know, perhaps more so than coming to the surface. So the south flank keeps moving, it makes some space for magma. Magma can go and fill those areas. The areas change over time as the south flank changes, movement changes over time as well. So down to uh, Akai Station, nothing obvious there. Up uh, on a trail. Nothing obvious there. These last two stations are close to the rift zone, so there's some interaction there as well. But, you know, we really don't see anything alarming anywhere else so just worth checking touching all of our bases here um, as we're, uh, we're trying to reassure people that lava is not going going down towards habitation at any point um, vis visibly from the data here right it's common for it to move around within an upper east ripstone area and within a summit complex and um, no issues with that I know that people sometimes will will get concerned when lava is not in sight anymore. Right? They wonder where it's going and it might not be coming back. And um, that's why, why I'm going to the this level of detail here. So adding to our understanding, let's make sure we touch on the earthquakes. There was a 4.2 under the south flank um, on Sunday, 11.41 a.m. It was preceded by two earthquakes in magnitude 3, 3.6, and 3.4. Um, it's still moving on the south flank. It's common. It says there have been 40 in the last 20 years. 4.0 or, or greater in that area. So um, aftershocks are likely. No detectable changes in activity at the summit or along the rift zones of Kilauea or Mauna Loa as a result. And so um, this was, was widely felt, if not just a 4.2, but the 3.6 and 3.4 beforehand as well. So let's check those out here. Here's our plot for the oh, too far. Plot for the, the last seven days on Hawaii Island and you know, a few background, Mauna Kea and settling earthquakes elsewhere. Mauna Loa has got a little bit of activity we've discussed. Uh, Pahala is, is still continuing in its activity. We'll touch on that slightly more here today. Um, but let's zoom in here to this Kilauea area. In the last seven days, you can see around the summit, a couple on this upper east rift, rift zone connector right through there. And otherwise, nothing all along the rift zone right through here, but some in the south flank area right through there. And our cluster of 4.2 and 3s and aftershocks are right in there. So let me zoom in on that a little more. And this is the Mauna Ulu vent up in here. This is the Mauna Ulu lava flows from 69 to 74. So we're looking at the western edge of those lava flows up along those big steep cliffs in the Pali uh, above uh, the zone of the Helena campground and through here. So. It is part of the Helena fault system through here, um, but these are deep faults along the Decomont, the basal, basal part, the bottom of the volcano against the seafloor, essentially, um, where um, we're not worrying about, about any kind of collapse or anything like that. You know, it's worth noting that um, the general public thinks of the Helena fault system differently than geologists uh, define it in, in scientific papers and literature. So this is not something we worry about collapsing. It's just a, a normal background event, but it is showing that there is movement of the south flank in this direction, and that points to this area in the bend of the rift zone right here. The rift zone starts off from the summit, going in a southeast direction, before it bends into a northeast direction over here. So this bend area right in here, and especially this first pinch zone, is an area of lots of adjustment historically, and uh, um, you would expect um, perhaps more eruptions there than anywhere further along. Um, depending on exactly the dynamics because of the adjustment necessary to navigate that pathway around the curve there. Okay, so let's look, look uh, um, 
at this one cross section. This is from Brown et al. 2010. I'm looking at a series of injections that happened uh, of dikes during the pool eruption. Um, so they actually have a series of, th of three dikes mapped in here, 97, 99, and 2007. They're really looking at the 2007 dikes. And so here is a summit caldera. This is a map view. Here is the bend in the rift zone right over there. Right? So you can see that at Pu'o, this 1997 dike that crossed the floor of Nepal crater, this blue line right in here, this is oriented parallel to the rift zone. That's what you expect right through there, right? That's the zone of weakness, right? That's the south flank moves in this direction, so that's how the ground wants to crack and open. But because there is this rotational aspect, you often have this, what's called an echelon, stepwise offset of these fissures. And so three different eras here, if you look at the green being 99 and Blue 97 and 2007 came in between, but even in, during one event, you have one segment and another one offset an echelon. That was the purpose of the study by Brown et al. And notice that's right in this torque zone right in here. The rift zone is actually moving in this direction. The path magma is this way, but it wants to inject magma right through there. That's the, that's the torque we're talking about. So it's conceivable that some kind of event like that could be happening during this 2007 event. It was associated with slow slip of the south flank at the same time. This is all during lava still moving through. Uh, did interrupt pool eruptions, of course, and 2007 actually erupted over here, the Father's Day eruption, kind of new Yohamo made the surface briefly, um, interrupting the pool activity. Um, so you never know, right? This is, a, this is a zone of the most adjustment. I wanted to show this uh, as a context. And let's scroll up here to the cross section because this really is showing us a little bit better. I like this one because it's, it's cut 90 degree angles, right? So you see not only the, the section in the north-south direction, you see some east-west, and then you see north-south back here again as well. So there is a summit, there is a shallow chamber, and there is a rift zone with a question mark of how it connects moving through, and you can have magma injecting in these dikes, these bodies that are essentially tabular sheets. Right? There's the east one right through there that come up from this pathway. May or may not reach the surface. In this case, this went from, a, from the other side of the chain of craters, from west of the rift zone all the way to the east of it and made a surface at kind of New Yohama, but the actual body was further over. So that kind of thing is possible. Um, but as magma comes into this, what I want to point out is this area over here on the right. This is our south flank. We might, you know, here's that, the Helena Pali faults. And so any kind of slumping gravity stuff is in that upper part of the stack of rocks. But along the base of the volcano, right below eight kilometers down, is this the Coleman slip uh, right through there where the base of the volcano moves along that old sea floor and that zone of weakness right through there. And so that's that's essentially what's happening. Magma could be coming in to areas like this, wherever it's moving in, it still seems to be pushing that south flank and triggering those earthquakes and doing so in an area close to here. And that's why this area right here is suspect as well. So um, that's, that's the, the earthquakes in that area. Um, Earthquakes under Pahala, there was a volcano watch that was released last week, um, and that is uh, a new research uh, of the earthquakes under Pahala. And I'll try to keep it short and, and simple here, but essentially there's, they're able to tell which direction the earthquakes are putting more pressure on. Is it more side to side or is it more up and down? And we know that magma is coming in from the hot spot into the area underneath Pahala, and those earthquakes are all very, very deep. And there's a lot of motion that happens that's sideways from the magma moving sideways and the, the rocks moving in adjustment side to side. So what they're suggesting here is that things changed a little bit in 2015 and again in 2019, where not only are you getting these side to side ones, you're also getting more of these up and down earthquakes. So that pathway is putting pressure up on the bottom of the volcano is essentially what's happening there. So they're saying that that requires essentially if you're if you're putting in more pressure, you essentially have a little bit more magma. Magma is building up, accumulating under there, but it's stalled. It's not really going anywhere. But it's enough to put pressure on an area from below and at least make the earthquakes snap the rocks slightly more up and down uh, at some times, and other times it's still continuing the, the the side to side activity. So you now have more up and down and still having side to side. And so the point of bringing this up now is that this is showing the hotspot is still very active. Magma is coming in. We may have a lot, like a long-term surge to both volcanoes of Mauna Loa and Kilauea, perhaps. We've, we've been seeing signs of since the, the start of the century, really. 
Um, so there is no sign of, of that stopping. And regardless of what's happening locally at the vent on a lava lake of Kilauea, we do know magma is coming in long term and something will give again at some point in time, sooner or later, uh, one way or the other. And so that's that's uh, something to note there. No cause for alarm. You know, more research coming coming here just does not mean that magma is going to burst through the ground here. That's not what I believe they're trying to say, right? Um, but rather that this nuance of the slight motion of the earthquakes at a very, very deep level is showing a little more upward pressure, like it's building up down there, right? In a sense where there's um, the capacity of the pathway from the hot spot uh, is it's full, essentially, right? It's putting pressure upwards in there. That's one, one interpretation, um, one new interpretation from this new research uh, um, of these deep earthquakes. So there's a map of where they are in case you're not familiar with the area. Pahala zone here, and most importantly, the depth here, right? We're looking at 30 kilometers to 40 kilometers down, right? 20 to 30 miles underground. And so really, um, that's the zone. It's still a long, long way from the surface and showing no sign of anything coming towards the surface. As far as we can tell, there's not anything shallow. There's no gas. There's no trim, you know, none of that kind of stuff that, that's linked to the surface there. So. Um, that's not the point here, so I'm make sure to emphasize that. There's no evidence for anything like that, anything new. It's more looking at the nuance of the earthquakes to try to learn more about the hot spot uh, as much as possible. And so magma is still coming to the volcano is the bottom line. And that means that likely the lava won't crystallize all the way before something else interrupts it. But let's look at that process anyways. And here's I promise to look at Kilowiki again. This is a Kilowiki. Um, cross-sectional um, cooling graph, right, that I've modified from the USGS here, uh, where they've drawn this, this cross-section of lava cooling from the outside in, from the top down, bottom up, right, and staying liquid at the center for the longest. What I've done is I've added here the notations of each time they actually drilled through that crest. They drilled through the cooling lava lake at Kilo'iki many, many times. And the first time it was only 22 feet thick before they found the liquid lava, and then a couple years later, there were a couple of times in between here that didn't, didn't write in. But by 62, 43 feet deep, 67, 84 feet down to the point where uh, 19, 1981, it was 198 feet down to liquid lava. By 1988, they actually only found lava within the, within the, the gaps between the cooling rock already. So given that whole process and timeline, the whole thing is thought to have become solid in 1995. That gives it a 36-year timeline of cooling, what in the end was a 135-meter, 440-foot lava lake. Now, the one at Hale Ma'uma'u is not quite twice this, but it's nearly twice this. So you might have a similar kind of profile, but a much, a much longer duration of time beyond four decades, believe it or not, if you could actually go through that uninterrupted. Okay. So... Um, Interesting, I wanted to pull up this, this volcano watch that was uh, from 2019. It refers to the 2018 lava as well, which that lava in some areas is pretty thick, not as thick as a Halemau lava lake, and not as thick as a Kilauea lava lake, but still thick in some areas as well. And what I wanted to point out here is that buried in this article, um, when they're discussing the lava that was offshore of Kapoho Bay, they discuss that the maximum thickness of that flow is about 250 meters east of the bay, formerly offshore of Kapoho Bay, right? And they indicate that, that with that value, right, that, that uh, the crust forming from above and below in that area um, would still leave, uh, uh, let's see what it says here, uh, have a thickness of 32 meters, right? The crust is 32 meters. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading it wrong here. The thick molten inner core should exist within the Aflo Delta and have a thickness of 32 meters in the bay, uh, 32 meters in the bay, and that's near the Four Corners area. And out in that area of maximum thickness, they're saying 232 meters is at the time of this article how much they thought molten lava was left underneath a crust. 232 is not very far from our 229 of a lava lake right now, and they note here that. They're using seven or eight, 850 Celsius as their solidus, the temperature below which they're considering a solid. So for that whole stack to get down below that temperature of 850 Celsius, 
they're noting over a century offshore, right? So that's where this over a century um, timeline is coming from. And so we have a similar dimensions here. That's the, that's the, the, the how long it takes to become all the way solid. More likely, something will erupt in the meantime. Something will be an earthquake. The lava will get pushed out of there, or interrupt it, whatever else. And we, you know, maybe maybe it forms that semi-solid plug of epimagma that Jagger describes back in the day, because it's going to take so long to cool and be resupplied with lava occasionally. Perhaps uh, keep the keep it extend the cooling process. You know, uh, might might be a one way to think of it. So that's a, cur a curiosity we'll have to we'll have a chance to look at here um, in Kilauea's future. Okay, so one last thing here, um, there is a new map released by the uh, USGS, it's, it says March, and I mean May, May 4th, 2021, Lower East Rift Zone Thermal Map, uh, recently released here. So this is a preliminary thermal map, um, correct on a map here, but so essentially uh, Matt Patrick, USGS, thermal data collected on March 4th. Oh, that is March, yeah. So it was actually actually collected on March 4th, right? So that's the, 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 the data set date. Um, my mistake there, my apologies. And let's zoom in here. So there is Ahu Isla Al, also known as Fisher 8, 24 area, and these wider areas are the areas that are still hot. So the pink outline of the flow is on here. So you can see there's still quite a lot of heat in these areas over here. Um, especially on either side of Ahu Isla Ao. Let's first move down the rift zone and down the lava flow. You can see there's still some heat uh, right here uh, along that rift zone area as well. And this is, what is that? Halakamahina area, I believe. Maybe that's the um, uh, Lani Puna area. So. We still see along this rift zone here. Um, lots of heat along there. Moving over, they didn't, they didn't really go that far off the rift zone in all, lots of these other areas. So you can see there, the areas in white are the ones that are hottest. And of course, this is on the USGS site. And we will post it to the hawaiitracker.com site as well. So let's as well make sure we don't look only down a rift, but also back up the rift where we've seen signs of, of thermal uh, dissipation as well and expansion. You know, so uh, um, hotter areas um, across a bigger area, but a, but a lower peak. So uh, looking here at fissures 9 and 10, there's still a little bit of heat. There's nothing uh, abnormally major here. In fact, it looks a little hotter by Ahu Isla Al and um, maybe around here, fissure 9 or so looks, might, might look a little hotter than, than 10 and this. Uh, the last most western segment over here. But let's keep going. Let's go all the way back down to Highway 130. Let's look across the highway at the Alaili area. And here we do see that area of heat still very persistent. This is an area that was reported by the USGS where lava came near the surface. They thought it might actually erupt given the gases being emitted. So the ground is very heavily cracked through there. We know that there's magma that came near the surface through there. There's magma underground in the rift zone. They're cooling post eruption. And it seems it's got a pretty easy pathway out for all those gases to come out and it's keeping keeping it hot as well. So obviously if the rift zone is weakened, that is of concern. Um, so nothing imminent here, right? But in the future you might imagine that this is some, something a place you might want to keep a closer eye on because you do see evidence of that weakened ground. And yeah, I know it's not what people in the area want to hear, but that's that's what the evidence is showing is that the, the ground is weaker there enough for the, the, the heat and the gas to come out. And it may be a long time before magma comes back in its pathway to try to come out there. Um, but someday, um, like much of the rift zone, and that's why the whole rift zone is this higher area of threat, it's, you can see that there is some deep cracks connected to heat through there. So we'll have to keep an eye on Ala Al Ili area. Let's if we zoom it out here, down over here. There's those brightest spots there, similar to what you see around Ahu Ala right through there and farther over east over here. So heat's still present in the lower east rift zone from much thinner areas, and so we're gonna see heat and we'll we'll have to just watch what happens here at the Kilauea summit. And 
we will await to see what happens next. So, uh, so make sure you keep your eye on hawaiitracker.com for our updates. Uh, we thank Hawaii Tracker for, for all the support um, and platform to give us here. And Dane, is there anything you want to add to our, our end here before we do our last round of questions? Um, I believe you pretty much summed it up. Uh, yeah, check out hawaiitracker.com. That is where we post all of our information. Uh, we keep it in chronological order, so it's easier to find what's new and relevant. <clears throat> but yeah, I do have some questions lined up for you here whenever you're ready to tackle those. Yeah, let's 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 give it some some chat. All right. So Brian asks, uh, how precise does the seismic activity that's being monitored have to be to predict lava movement, like an intrusion or something along those lines? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, normally, the number of earthquakes in a distribution, even even with the error of the machine processing, is enough to give you an idea. Because normally, it's it's the numbers and the, the average location that matters the most. So during a seismic crisis, an eruptive crisis, the the automatic um, monitoring is good enough. Although it's not a, it's not super super precise to to answer that question, right? Um, it's possible after the fact to come through and try to uh, relocate earthquakes as a group, knowing that it took similar pathways and improve the error and essentially focus your uh, your resolution there. And when there are studies that detect pathways and um, shapes of the edges of magma chambers, that they're using that more precise technique, um, which is uh, uh, also more more processing. So that that kind of kind of insight is more um, um, more long term, right? And then during a the short term, when something's actually happening, then just looking at the average of more or less where it is and how many there are is good enough. Right. We have a 699 CA super chat from AH Boomer. It says, looking forward to the consolidated drones on video. Short ones are great, but can't wait to see them uh, start to finish. They also ask, uh, once we get, once I get done with all the drones on video, uh, will I consolidate them into a single bid? Um, yeah, that's the plan. Um, try and make it into one seamless video going through the eruption day by day. Uh, might take a little while though. It's you know, we're about what day fourteen in on the uh, drones on video, and the, yeah, it's gonna go what eighty something days. So probably more too because I have a bunch of stuff after the eruption, which is some of the most interesting stuff to me. Like there are some crazy stories post eruption when everybody wasn't looking anymore, and mm -hmm. we're out and they're like you know crawling over the lava into some spots that are completely surreal experiences in there so yeah right. there's probably going to be some episodes even after the eruption technically ends to that series so it's going to be a while you know <laughs> before that consolidated video gets in but i appreciate everybody that's checking that out um good amount of work goes into each one of those and it, yeah some heavy stuff in there this one yeah. and this one's no different than the last and it's right on the cusp of getting even heavier too once we get into May 18th, May 19th, that's the phase two of the eruption when everything kicks up a notch. So yeah, we're right yeah. there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're doing doing a, doing a great job, Dane. Yeah, and exactly. You know, even though you're, you know, the, there's just it's too much to relive it every single day with the same pressure and stress as it actually happened. It's just no point in putting ourselves through that. You know, especially you put right. yourself through through all that. Yeah. Um, um, right now is the time. I, I want to say it was May 24th, so it would have been yesterday. Would have been the reactivation of Ahualao and the, the timeline sequence, and you'll get to that if you you know yeah. the very first drones on video put out is coming up here. For those well, yeah, of you guys, um, the thing is, is like there's things that happen. I was going through the timelines or the time lapses that I made from the PG cam, and Fisher Eight reactivated on the 17th, the night of the 17th, for right. just a little while, a little just bit. a little while, but it reactivated then as well as some other fishers, you know, like they pop up and then they turn back off after just a couple hours. But yeah, we're right at that that point where it creeps back up to fisher eight. We're right on that point where things are turning back on. 
Right, right, and probably the height of height of the 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 stress for people, right? The the, the hell night week is this this week essentially. So as people look yeah. back at their feeds or whatever else they may come across that that stuff. Yeah. So, but really, yeah, you're doing an awesome job. Yeah, that's going to be our summer series here. And, you know, right. it's going to go on for a while. Um, and, and maybe fall yeah. series too, and then winter yeah, yeah. series. Time. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, it's over by then. But that seems like the, the timeline I'm keeping right now. Yeah, and meanwhile, while we're talking about it, you know, we, we may we may uh, uh, round down a little bit uh, our other volcano updates um, um, as both Kilo and Mauna Loa right now are a slightly uh, reduced activity. And of course, you know, we can come back in at any point in time, but we'll, we'll still come every week. But maybe yep. starting next week, we'll start once a week on Tuesday and next week, Tuesday, we'll cover both Kilo and Mauna Loa. And um, we'll go from there until it's only a matter of time before something else pulls us back to the, the, the increased schedule and uh some of you guys have commented oh what are you guys going to talk about when there's no more active lava the back the backlog of topics is huge still right. so um it's there's a lot of stuff we don't have time to work on um because of this eruption happening and so um there's still plenty to talk about stay tuned you know throughout even if we don't bring you guys as much uh, live uh, volcano updates we'll still put out some other content for you guys and interesting stuff and historical stuff and stuff as well yeah so basically we're moving the alert level on kilauea at least internally back down to yellow internally so that's that, right yeah internally back down to that once a week status but you know if something goes off on mauna loa or kilauea we'll probably be back on maybe doing doing dailies again you know daily updates but that's just you know yeah we, we scale up and down with the what the volcanoes are doing yeah, and it's been five months, and it's been it's been a joy to share all this with everybody. But uh, you know, at some point, it's we, we need to, you got to step back and get some context and refresh as well. So that's right. that's the, that's where, that's where you know we you, you you learn on volcanoes. You do it when a volcano lets you. So this this might be a little window here, and we'll see how long it lasts. Oh, next questions. Yeah, Nathan asks. Uh, he's always found it interesting how the EQs can. The earthquakes can be so prevalent uh, and common during an eruption in certain areas, but there's literally no, nothing in between those active areas showing up on the seismic. Uh, can you explain that phenomenon at all? Well, so to have an earthquake, you have to have a situation where you have a fault that has some, that sticks to some degree, so you actually can release it through an earthquake. Some parts of the area of the faults may move through slow slip or through creep and not and not, not actually generate earthquakes. So that's basically the fundamental of it is that depending on the dynamics of the actual fault, some areas generate earthquakes more than others, just by the nature of how of of, of the friction in that particular part of the fault. So that's why they happen. That's why there are certain patches that you you look at as as the, the indicators the representative of the region. So yeah, good question, Nathan. We have a ten dollars super chat from Jacob Steele who asks, "Has there been any correlation between animal behavior and eruptions in Hawaii?" I saw something in Italy where octopuses gave warning to an eruption. Giving warning to the eruption is a little, little different. So we we have seen a little bit of interaction. And the most obvious thing is the earthquakes and the koki frogs stopping a chirp, right? Yeah. Just like the the. Uh, the vibrations um, come through at different frequencies, and depending on the animal, it detects it before it hits the seismograph or or other instrument that we, you know, hits our own our own motion sensor as humans. So there's a little bit of that association, but I haven't seen any um, um, any anecdotes of anything predictive in Hawaii, at least as far right. as as life. And if there's any, anyone yeah. has heard any, heard anything, we'll we'll listen, but haven't heard of it. Right, you have the the frogs, which are very sensitive, and then normal pe people, which can detect, you know, twos and threes, and then somebody like me that doesn't feel any of them unless it's over a five. <laughs> and that's the true right there. Well, uh, we appreciate the ten dollars super chat, Jacob. Really appreciate that. Hello, Jacob. All right, so diving into the next one. Um, oh yes, uh, Red Rover asks, could you please? point out and show on the map on a map where the borehole they drill down to measure the water table at so that'd be the keller well keller which well, we haven't yeah. had an update on for since the eruption began i believe but it has some variability in the depth of the water we saw 
what was it 10 meters of change between pre-2018 and post-2018 and then we thought it saw another 10 meters of change from after 2018 to pre-2020 eruption mm -hmm. so let me see if yeah, i can find variation i'm not sure where my my killer well map is i'll show you the approximate location on this on this uh of the earthquake map, I guess. Approximately. Yep. All right. So there's a summit, summit of Kilauea, and a color well is down in, in a southern area somewhere in here. I'll see if I can find. I just, I just sent you one. one with a marking. Okay. That so on here. It's not gray, but it's something. Yeah, there you go. NSF well, it's marked on here. Right in here. So that's it. That's that's about where it is on its south side of the caldera. And we, you know, we can talk about wells and groundwater. R groundwater is one of those topics that is on the docket, docket or more coverage at some point when there's time to talk about it. So yeah, we can... Um, it's the only well up at the summit area. There's other wells further further down the rift zone and closer to the coast that are also uh, giving us information. All right. Well, let's see here. Do we have any more questions? <coughs> oh, yes. Uh, one last one. Also from Nathan. He asks, uh, are the tilt meters, is there still tilt meters falling into the Pu'o'o crater? Uh, do they plan on installing more tilt meters or GPS there? I have not heard any inf inside information on the status of any tilt meters. Whoa, it looks like right. like one is putting out at least one azimuth of data. The other one's putting out two azimuths of data. I don't know how reliable they are. That's something we'd love to hear from the USGS um, status of those instruments. Which ones they would they would personally uh, rely on more? Right. Sure. And I don't think there's any more actually following into the crater actively that was positioned on the edge and is now sinking in that did happen right but i don't think that's what we're dealing with now at least and i don't know about putting new tilt meters down there i'd rather them be further up the uh the rift zone maybe mana ulu area somewhere around the there just for added idea of what's happening in that upper rift zone right on that bend like but that's just me right now like the the middle east rift zone haven't seen that much, but you know, it's always important to monitor. I just don't know if it, it's still pretty heavily monitored is my point between the jacuzzi stations and the North pick station. And there's still a few stations there that are active and good stations to keep track of, but there's still holes right. Right, along right. that rift zone where we just right. don't know what's happening. Yeah. And, and the, re the reason Port was, is extra important is because there might be a, a little bit of a magma chamber there, right? Like there is under Makapui right. in their pool. So that, that area might be more balloony more sensitive to those pressures and so that might it might be a, a signal that's easy to monitor so we'd love to you know love to know um, which of those poo or poc stations if they're trustworthy or they'll be upgraded or replaced or have been already perhaps I, I don't know we haven't heard anything about that we just know that right. not all the data streams online are updated um on a, on a public side of things all right well i believe that's it for the questions uh we didn't get to yours we apologize there is a good amount between all the different chat rooms that we do um so thank you phil thank you chat thank you everybody that joined us we will be doing another premiere of drones on uh, immediately following this live stream be covering may 16th and 17th of the 2018 eruption so i hope to see you there i will be in chat uh taking any questions again all right, Mahalo. back to you, Phil. Mahalo, Dane. Mahalo for all our, our, our question askers. Uh, you know, like Dane said, we'll try to get some of, the, some of those in the comments if we haven't got to them yet. And uh, sometimes it takes a little while, but I do, I do try to come through um, at, at least every couple of weeks and, and catch up on some of the old ones here. So um, we'll try to get to your questions if we can. Uh, mahalo for, for staying engaged with us. Mahalo for your donations, those of you guys who are contributing. Um, Please, once again, subscribe, share, like. It's a lot of things to do, but we appreciate it. That's a little way to a little way to show us some love. And until next time, which will be, we'll bring you guys one more um, uh, Friday update here on Mauna Loa before we switch to our week 
scheduled next week. So once again on Friday, um, we'll be back with an update. And until then, uh, for Hawaii Tracker, he is Dane DuPont. I am Philip Long. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>